I discovered a 1,200-year-old manuscript in a monastery library. What it says still haunts me. I am writing this post anonymously because if anyone found out that I wrote this, my academic reputation would be ruined forever. As bizarre and frankly disturbing as what I'm about to tell you is, I assure you it's all true. I am an academic historian and researcher of the Byzantine Empire. I have published dozens of influential papers in academic journals, and I have a permanent teaching position at a major state university in the United States. My main area of research is on the influence of classical mythology on Byzantine hagiography in the 6th through 9th centuries CE. I'm used to reading all sorts of bizarre stories about Eastern Orthodox saints, such as St. Christophoros, who, according to some stories, had the head of a dog, St. Simeon the Holy Fool, who is said to have pretended to be stupid and insane to avoid being praised for his holiness, and the stylites, who lived on top of columns for years on end without ever coming down. Nearly two decades ago, however, I discovered something really, truly weird, something no other Byzantinist has ever seen. As much as I have studied it, I still can't explain it rationally. Back in late September 2001, I was visiting a very old Greek Orthodox monastery at Mount Tathos in northern Greece near Thessaloniki that had been founded in around the 7th century CE. The old monk who was the head of the monastery showed me to the monastery library, which was a dusty, disorganized room with an assortment of all kinds of texts and manuscripts of all different ages stacked on rows of old wood shelves. I knew as soon as I saw it that it was a treasure trove of information. I was hoping I might find new texts that scholars did not already know about. After sorting through stat after stack of medieval manuscripts, I came across a manuscript that caught my attention. It wasn't like any of the others. For one thing, it was clearly one of the oldest manuscripts in the collection. Many of the manuscripts in the collection dated to the 14th century or later, but this one was definitely from the early 9th century. That wasn't all that was unique about it, though. It was also the thickest book in the collection by far. I opened it up and found a strange text written in Byzantine Greek. The very first line on the very first page read as follows. In my uh, translation, Herenly the prophecies of Didymos of Thessaloniki, son of Amphilochios, all things that are yet to come until the day of judgment are recorded in this tome. I was instantly intrigued by this find. I continued reading. The book began with a detailed description of major events that happened in the Byzantine Empire over the course of the 9th century CE. Although the description was written as a prophecy, I knew that the text must have been written after the fact. Such vaticiniax eventa are extremely common in ancient and medieval prophetic texts. Whenever someone in ancient or medieval times wanted to write something and make it seem like it was truly prophetic, they would write about something that had already happened, but present the description of it as though it were a prediction. As I continued reading, though, I began to feel more and more puzzled. The book just kept describing more and more events. It moved on from the 9th century to the 10th century, and from there to the 11th, then the 12th, then the 13th. Strangely, though the book did not seem like a 13th century work, it very much seemed like it had been written in the early 9th century. I was starting to suspect 
that the book I was holding was a deliberate modern forgery in other words, not Byzantine at all, but rather a nefarious hoax. I was perplexed, however, because everything about the manuscript aside from its contents clearly indicated it had been written in the early ninth century. The parchment was definitely ninth century parchment. The text was written in perfect ninth century Byzantine Greek without any of the anomalies one would expect from a modern forgery. The handwriting was characteristic of the ninth century Byzantine style. If this document was a forgery, it could only have been forged by someone extremely knowledgeable. Indeed, only a world-renowned expert could have possibly created such a forgery. As I continued reading, I came to a description of the rise of Mehmet II, the foal of Constantinople, to the Ottoman Turks in 1453, and the death Constantinos, the eleventh Palaiologos, the last emperor of the Byzantine Empire. The document then moved on from describing events in Byzantine history to events in world history at large. It described the rise of the Aztec and Incan empires, the European discovery of the Americas, the Protestant Reformation, the Ming Dynasty in China, the founding of the Mughal Empire in India, and other events. It even covered an extensive detail, events that contemporary historians have no knowledge of. For instance, it described events taking place in parts of North America, Africa, and Australia that we have no record of. As I continued reading, the text continued describing events in world history, growing closer and closer to the present day. It described all the major events of the 18th and 19th centuries, including the Seven Years' War, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the rise of Napoleon, the colonization of Australia, the Greek War for Independence, British Crown rule in India, the Opium Wars, the American Civil War, the 19th century revolutions, in Central and South America, the partition of Africa, and so on. Then came a chilling and detailed account of the wars and devastation of the early 20th century. World War I, the overthrow of Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, the overthrow of the Qing Dynasty, the 1918 Spanish influenza pandemic, the rise of communism, the Great Depression, the rise of the Nazis in Germany, World War II, the Holocaust, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Greek Civil War, the Cold War. This author knew everything. He gave all the exact names, dates, and locations of all the events he described. The dates were given on the Byzantine Anno Mundi calendar other than the Western Anno Domini calendar, but they were all correct. Finally, after describing the events of the latter half of the 20th century, including the founding of the United Nations, the founding of the European Union, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the origins of the Internet, the text came to the 21st century. I was expecting it to end there, but it just kept going. It described the attacks of September 11th, 2001 in great detail. Even though the attacks had only happened a matter of a few weeks before and most of the details were, at that time, not publicly known, then I read something that made my blood turn cold and every hair on my body stand on end. The document read, once again, in my translation, this book of prophecies will be discovered. In the library of a monastery at Mount Tathos in the first month of the year 7510 since the creation of the cosmos, according to the Romans, the year which they in that year shall know as 2001. 
it will be discovered by a scholar named my full name, who will be greatly astonished at the accuracy of these predictions. He will steal this book and take it back to the land they will call America, where it shall reside for a generation. I was shocked when I read this. I was certain that the manuscript had to be some kind of joke. I looked around to see if anyone was going to jump out and laugh at me, but there was no one there. It was just me, sitting alone in the monastery library. The first month of the Byzantine calendar, September. That means the author of that manuscript somehow knew not only the exact year, when I would come find the book, but the exact month as well. The manuscript was right about me stealing it too, although that may have been a self-fulfilling prophecy to some extent. I stole the manuscript from the monastery and smuggled it across the Atlantic back to the United States. I kept the manuscript a complete secret and didn't tell any of my colleagues about it. The only reason why I am telling you about the manuscript now is because for the past 18 years, I have been keeping careful track of all the prophecies in the manuscript. Every single prophecy that was supposed to come true in the past 18 years has. The manuscript predicted the war on terror, the Great Recession, the rise of right-wing nationalist populism, the election of Donald Trump as President of the United States, Brexit, and even the recent fires in the Amazon rainforest. If it was a major event, the manuscript predicted it. I now know that the prophecies in that book are, somehow, completely genuine. None of the manuscript's past predictions scare me, though. What truly scares me is what the manuscript says is going to happen next. I desperately hope that what that manuscript says is going to happen doesn't happen, but everything it has ever predicted has come true so I see no reason why what it says is coming won't come. It seems that the imminent tribulations are inevitable. We like to think that the world is getting better, that the horrors of the present are merely transitory, but I fear that what is yet to come is far, far worse than anything we have seen already. Soon, very soon, suffering and death will rain down upon the world. There will be plagues and droughts and food shortages. Many people, especially poor people and people living in poor countries, will die. There will be terrible wars that will destroy countless lives. Resources will run low. It will be a time unlike any other. Now you may be thinking, yeah, yeah. I've heard a million different predictions about how the end of the world is going to happen soon, and how it's going to be so awful, and then it never happens. The problem is the manuscript doesn't say that the end of the world is coming soon. In fact, it says just the opposite. The end of the world won't come for a very long time, but it would be a mercy compared to all the hardships we have left to endure. Story 2. Working in a public library can be hell sometimes. Kim Davis, that woman is Kim Davis, in my library, looking at my display for Arts and Crafts Month. Panic rises in the back of my throat. What should Edo, the correct answer, the ale approved answer, of course, is nothing. I'm in a Kentucky library, not rural Kentucky, where one may expect to see the woman who became the face of the anti-gay movement in the days after marriage equality became the law by refusing to grant licenses to same-sex couples but to Kentucky. All the same, so she could conceivably be here as a normal patron, and even if she wasn't, if she was here to tour Louisville and spread a message of hate, that doesn't matter either. I'm a public librarian. I serve all people, 
terrible bigots or not, but still my heart aches and I feel like an animal trapped in a cage. I want to tweet, want to take pictures, want to confront her. My radical queer activist self is fighting with my public services are for everyone librarian self. Jesus Christ, why is she in my library? And then the woman turns, and the adrenaline runs straight out of me. Oh, I was wrong, that isn't Kim Davis. She just looks a lot like Kim Davis from the side. Same stringy hair, lined face, but maybe not so dead inside. Maybe that's the difference. Oh, shit. She's walking towards me. Can I help you? I ask, cheerfully, my customer service voice. Perfect and not revealing a damn thing of the internal conflict, I just went through staring at this woman. I just want to check these out. She smiles to why, and makes eye contact too long, and the crazy alarm in the back of my head goes off. I correct myself mentally, trying to show some of the compassion this profession expects of me. The perceived mental illness alarm. I've been working in public libraries for more than five years, and I've developed a pretty good sense of when someone might suddenly start screaming at you for mentioning a library feeny in the wrong tone. I scan the woman's library card see. Her name isn't Kim Davis. You idiot tan. Begin. I scan her pile of books. When my attention and the attention of all the patrons in the library shifts to a man who had also been on my perceived mental illness radar begins to scream about Jesus Christ being the savior to the unborn at a very normal looking young black woman who's making eye contact with me like is this really happening and am wondering if between the incidents like this and the near-constant stream of articles online about dying libraries. If this job is really worth it as I stand and apologize to the Kim Davis lookalike, I'm sorry, he'll be right back, sir, sir. Could you please lower your voice? One of the circulation clerks takes over with Kim while I talk. To the anti-abortion crazy sorry purse mentally, oh man, who has political views that differ from my own. He agrees, surprisingly easily, that maybe he shouldn't be in the library today, and that he'll head home. I follow him to the front of the library, and make sure he's significantly off property before turning back to look inside the library, and take a mental image of the whole scene as I plan the incident report I now have to write. Kim is chattering away with the clerk maybe I was wrong, they seem to be, having a very nice conversation, and she looks sympathetic to our situation. The young woman the man was yelling at has gone back to browsing adult fiction and seems fine, though I should make sure to apologize to her before she leaves, and the computers are full, as always. The other librarian on shift is helping a self-declare computer literate person through a job application to McDonald's. There's a group of teens in the teen section that looks like they might soon be getting rowdy enough that the patrons at the computers will complain, and there are no less than eight unaccompanied children between the ages of seven and and eleven absorbed in Roblox in the children's section. At least they're sharing, I think to myself as I pass, seeing that they're sitting to, to a computer in most instances. Still, something rattles me about the makeup of the patrons in the library today. We're usually a lot less white, I realize, and a lot of these white people have that same rural dash white dash could dash be dash a dash relative dash of dash Kim dash Davison or mistaken dash for dash the dash woman dash herself loke that poor sorry disavant people from the counties far out of Louisville have lots of premature wrinkles and white t 
t-shirts. That man took books. The page has surprised me by getting so close. He would am put off by her general lack of professionalism. You don't need to shout at your co-worker, and you certainly don't accuse a patron, mentally ill, at anti-abortion, or not of stealing books in the earshot of other patrons. He took at least five. I saw him. I'm sure you did, Phyllis. Did you think to say anything to him, to me, before his outburst? I groan and head for the door again, hoping I can still see him and shout something like, Sir, I think you forgot to check out your items. He's nowhere to be seen. But I notice a giant truck in the parking lot. What the hell? Who drove this unmarked little brother to a semi to the library? Didn't they have a smaller car? Am at least gonna tweet about this weird truck when I'm on break. I turn to go back to the library and realize Phyllis is holding court to whatever patrons will listen about the man that supposedly stole books. Jesus, woman, I know you're way too old to be paid barely over minimum wage to shell books, but you should know not to talk to patrons about other patrons, especially about patron misbehavior. My mental to-do list lengthens. Incident report. See if Phyllis remembers the section he stole from so we can shelf read and mark the books. Missing email to manager about worrying over Phyllis' professionalism with patrons. Great. Not Kim Davis is in the growing clump of patrons. Talking to a staff member who should really know better about the strange patron's behavior. She's nodding and pointing and Phyllis gestures me over when I get close. She says she knows him. Says she gave him a ride here and he might be waiting near her truck. Her truck. Of course not Kim Davis drove the weird truck and the weird patron Anne. I tease fine. It's just some books. No one is listening to me. The group is headed for the parking lot. Tend Phyllis is their queen. Shit, I might have to call a manager right now. Is she inciting a riot for some James Patterson trash? I look back at the circulation desk. The clerk is experienced and is handling the line and phone easily. The other librarian is returning from helping McDonald's application, so they're covered. I can try to de-escalate whatever the hell is going on in the parking lot before things get to crazy. I exit the library to see more people than I remember in the gaggle that left standing behind the giant truck. What are these used for? It's a refrigerated truck, right? Food transport. Notcom Davis is on the back bumper, unlocking the big door and talking about something. I step into the back of the group and listen. Crazy when I pulled over to the side of the road to pick him up, mumbling about Jesus and fetuses, and what if Mary had an abortion? Should have known then that something was off about him. She opens the truck and again something strikes me as deeply strange. The crazy alarm is going off again, screaming in the back of my head. But none of the patrons around me or Phyllis seem to have that same instinct. The inside of the truck seems to be empty, but there's this weirdness to the shape of it, like it has a false bottom or something because the floor doesn't start at not Kim Davis' feet. It starts near her thighs. Andes, I can see there's another door to access that storage. Is that how these trucks are made? I skin that crowd. Now, did more patrons come out of the library? Yes, they must have. I see more of the rural-looking whites and a few regulars getting nosy about all the commotion and I... Make eye contact with the young black woman that the man had been yelling at looks extremely concerned. I can tell she feels the wrongness of the situation as keenly as I do, and is hanging back, 
yards away, not joining the throng, I come back to myself. I should be de-escalating this situation, whatever it is that's happening here. I look back into the truck and see that there is, in fact, a stack of books near the cab of the truck. I can't see if they have library markings from here, so I take a couple steps forward to see better. Not Kim Davis is talking again, and not really listening because the alarm bells in my head are filling me with adrenaline. Am sweating, I realize, sweating enough that you can see it through my cardigan and everything feels wrong. The crowd is too big, and they're shoving each other a little and yelling, and the books in the back of the truck are a librarian trap. I realize, and even though that doesn't make any goddamn sense, I pull back towards the library quickly as not Kim Davis opens the second compartment. A smell hits me, even from back here, from so far away of rot. I see glimpses of pink and white and she's grabbing something, something big and corpse. It's a corpse tosses it into the middle of the crowd where it splits on the pavement and spills out gore and thank God it's only a big corpse. That dear God, it's a big corpse. And there's screaming and I see the young black woman running away while the whites that were out of place are pushing the crowd together and someone is digging through the corpse. Oh my God, they're eating. Oh my God, they're eating. And someone bites someone else, and I can't even tell if it's a regular patron or one of the out-of-place ones. And there's more screaming, and she's throwing more corpses, and she's shouting. And I swear I hear pigs squealing, but I know there aren't any live pigs here. And my last thought before I black out is, this is going to be one hell of an incident report. Story 3 I found my autobiography at the local library. I've probably been going to the library since I was six years old. Any time I felt like I was being bullied at school or unappreciated by my parents, the imaginative worlds I could explore in books was a small comfort. Sometimes I could spend hours there combing the shelves and reading whatever latest newfound treasure I could snatch up. My favorites were things like Harry Potter and Redwall, anything that was so different than what I was dealing with back home. My all-time go-to book when things got really bad, though, was The Neverending Story. If you haven't heard of it, that's the one where a kid goes into a bookstore and finds a mysterious enchanted book that literally transports him into a fairy tale world that he is able to control and change. For a wide-eyed dreamer like me, the experience was magic. I could feel like Bastion, and not have to worry about my stepmom, my starving siblings, or, well, anything. That's the reason I went there last week to find the never-ending story curl up in a chair in the back room where Miss Salazar makes fresh apple pies on Wednesdays and just read it until the sun went down. When I got there, though, and went to the spot where it was tucked away, I was disappointed to find that it had been checked out. I went to the front counter and asked Miss Salazar if that was the only copy and then she gave me more bad news. Looks like whoever checked out that book last never returned it. I'm sorry, it'll probably be a while before we get another copy, she told me. I pretended it wasn't a big deal, and started looking through the new arrivals to distract myself. Nothing was jumping out at me like I had hoped, and I went back to the young fiction section in the hopes that maybe I was wrong and maybe it would be returned. That was when I saw that someone had tucked another book in its spot. It stood out from the rest as being larger and had a cover made of black leathery material, like boots. I pulled it out, 
thinking someone had misplaced it and then noticed the name on the cover. It was my own. Now, I'm not the sort to get spooked or anything, but that seriously made me curious to say the least. I looked around and tried to see if I could spot whoever had slipped the book onto the shelf, but no one nearby acted like they knew anything about it. I slipped it under my arm and walked toward the back as Miss Salazar was pushing the dolly around and placing books back on the shelf. Did you find what you were looking for? She asked me as I covered up the title. I smiled in thanks and opened it up to see what this strange book had inside. The first page seemed like an author's dedication for Maria. That was my birth mom's name. My curiosity got stronger and I flipped to the first chapter. I've lived here all my life. Some might even say I was meant to die there too. I stopped those people though. I stopped everything from happening. Now all I can do is write a record of it and make sure it never happens at all. There was a small card attached on the next page. Again, it was my own signature. There was no mistaking it. And below that a date, September 12th, 2028. I closed the book up and pushed it away. I didn't have time for stupid pranks. I walked home, frustrated that someone had taken my favorite book and replaced it with this dumb shit. But when I got home, the book was sitting there out by my mailbox. There was another note attached. Keep reading. I was tempted to burn it, but something inside me convinced me that this book was special. I sighed and took the book inside. My stepmom was too busy getting drunk, and my siblings were running around chasing each other like demon cats. I went into my room and closed the door, trying to see what else the book had to say. There was plenty about my childhood growing up here with my siblings, the time I broke my ankle in fourth grade. It seemed to know everything about me. You don't know me, and you probably never will. But ten years from now, you'll be a different man. You'll wish you had made different choices. This book is designed to help you make those choices. There were newspaper articles inside, crumbled and barely legible. But I recognized pictures of myself, except I looked older. Wanted for homicide and the first degree for murdering his family on September 5, 2018, and has been on the run ever since. That was today I stared at the image on the page. It showed my house in flames and the fire department trying to save those inside. I saw another page, another crime. There were dozens of them. Bodies. People I had buried or left for dead, some without their skin, others without tongues. Why had this all happened? Why had I turned into this monster? I kept flipping through the book, searching for answers and only finding more destruction. Then I got to the end. You know the truth now, but nothing will prepare you for it, even with this knowledge. The choice is still yours to make. I hope you make the right one. It was my signature, of course, and a picture of a much younger me. I was holding the hand of a woman that I had never met. On the back was a date, my birthday. Why was she holding me as a baby? That wasn't what my stepmom had told me at all. There was a knock at the door and my stepmom entered with a plate of food. What the hell are you looking at? She asked, slurring her words. I showed her the picture. She didn't even try to deny it. Yeah, dot, 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 that's the old pitch. I thought I burned them all. Hell, I guess you'd figure it out one day anyway, she said, snatching the photo away and then ripping it to shreds in front of me. 
You ain't ever gonna see her again anyway. Might as well just quit your whining and get those chores done, she snapped. She walked out of my room laughing. I've been staring at the book for about an hour now, staring at that signature. An older me, sending this as a gift, helping me to make things right. I hear her downstairs with the TV blaring. I think the stove is still on. I know what has to be done. Story 4. I work at a university library. I'm afraid one of the students isn't alive. Heather always struck me as a weird kid, although a very sweet one. She seemed way younger than her peers, like the runt of a litter. But I more than once overheard other students talking about her being some sort of teenage genius, as it happens to most brilliant people. She didn't seem to pay a lot of attention to the world around her, but she tried her best. I heard you had a nasty car accident, Miss Thompson. Are you to hurt, she asked me just the other week, her eyes full of genuine concern. I think you're mistaking me for another librarian, darling, I replied, then went back to reading my own book. Our uni was a big complex with four major libraries with three or more librarians each, and a few smaller ones. Funnily, all of us lived up to the librarian stereotype very well thirty or forty-something, tortoise eyeglasses, hair in a perfect bun, a pencil dress topped with a cardigan. There wasn't much to do these days as our collection was completely catalogued in the uni app, so we were there mostly to handle paperwork and help with the restricted section. One of the only places that remain completely free from the modern world's scrutiny. Most students had no interest in the library, let alone in the forbidden books, so I had all the time in the world to just go around hissing sh if I wanted to. It was the perfect job for any introvert, a quiet place with little to no interaction. Lately, my days consisted of silently watching over people. Heather, I heard, was pursuing a scientific career, but she always had a dreamy look on her face. When she read our books, we were located in the history department. I only became concerned when she started asking for witchcraft books from the restricted section. Oh, and just doing some research for fun. Interesting how women turn to magic because it seems to be the easier way for us to gain power. As she gave me a half smile. She was so pale and clearly concerned about something big. I couldn't help but peek over her shoulder a little. How to create a new human body? Wax. It must amount to two-thirds of the person's original weight. An object they held dear in life. This will bind the soul. The ashes from any book. See above how to ensure that you obtain this material minimizing loss. As much hair from the subject as possible. This ingredient will give the new body verisimilitude. Please remember that the above is meant to give a new body to a person that's barely clinging to life. If your subject has already passed, it's crucial to add their own ashes and blood from a living fox. In this case, the fox will act as a recipient for the soul and must stay beside the person at all times. Obviously, this was all bullshit, Emma Rational, 33 years old woman, after all. I know better. Still, Heather was so pale, her lips were so bluish, that I feared that she was either terminally ill or already dead, which is a ridiculous thought, but come to think of it, I didn't see her interacting with anyone else but me in the last couple of weeks. Besides, she was a smart kid. If she was dedicating this much time to such things, maybe they held more than historical interest. 
I was intrigued and had too much time in my hands. My fiac had been staying at the hospital with his sick mother lately, and I didn't have any pets or roommates, so I had to admit things were a little too lonely. So over the next few days, I helped Heather get some ancient witchcraft books, then casually walked behind her looming like a ghost, stealthy as a cat. There was no doubt she was particularly interested in reviving people through old sorcery. The dark circles under her eyes grew bigger by the day. Her hair was matted and tangled, and I started convincing myself that she looked like she was rotting alive. It was a Friday when I couldn't hold back anymore and decided to ask her if she was dying. I gave the poor girl a jump scare. Oh, it's you, Miss Thompson, she muttered. No, I'm not dying. This is for someone I know. They must be really important to you. Then I replied, well, we're not really close. What I think her dying now would be horribly unfair, she replied, biting her incredibly pale lips. Looking closer, I realized she looked so bad because she hadn't been sleeping or eating properly, focused on her research. You're a good girl, Heather, I praised her, then started leaving. Miss Thompson, yes, seating person is you. I laughed. I'm not ill, sweetie, thanks for worrying. Yes, you're not ill. You're in a coma with no hope of returning. And your body is not actually here. Heather took me to the hospital, where I saw my own body fading, a feeling so eerie it's hard to explain. There was no doubt it was me, badly injured and hanging to life by a thread. When you've been in a coma for weeks like I had, it's hard to come back from it. And even if you do, your muscles will malfunction and your body will be so weak that you're prone to catching a myriad of infections and dying anyway. My sister is a nurse here. That's how I found out about you, Heather explained and a whispered as she cut a huge piece of my hair. I couldn't stop staring at my physical body. It was so pale, nearly lifeless. Unfortunately, the ritual can only extend your life for a few years, a decade at best, and it can't be done a second time because it won't work with your wax body. I nodded, paying close attention to her. All done here. She carefully placed the hair inside a ziplock bag. Let's go to your place to gather the other ingredients. I bought the wax in advance. Are you sure you want to do this for me? I asked. Isn't it something evil, unnatural? Oh, evil and unnatural is what they tried to do to you. You all understand when you meet my sister. But first, you know, let's create your new vessel. My new body was successfully created. I can't recall a lot of details because my soul was being penned to the wax and the process can be overwhelming to one's senses. But I remember hearing Heather chanting and a lot of bright lights. Moving around with it felt natural, almost like it was my original body. However, it came with a number of limitations. Heather recited them to me after I spent a few hours learning how to move around in it. Any exam that tries to look inside your body will be unsuccessful and show nothing. You need to avoid getting sick at all costs if you don't want to be studied as a medical aberration. Your body cannot take more than five minutes of sunlight a day, and sunscreen doesn't work. The only way is staying indoors as much as possible and always protecting your face with a hat. You can make your body turn the dust that will end reappear in another spot within your view. However, you'll be even more vulnerable to sun for a week after each time. Your body will immediately melt if it touches salt water, hot water, or acid substances. 
Keep that in mind, even for trivial tasks. And always wear gloves just in case. At least once a month, you need to ingest wax to strengthen your body. A single candle will suffice. Is that all I asked? It isn't that bad. My sister Susan will explain the last rule to you, Heather announced, and a woman who looked just like her, but several years older, and in white scrubs entered the room. Miss Laura Thompson, am happy to see you well, she greeted me, and we exchanged formalities. You must recall that your fianc's mother was very ill before your accident, right? I nodded. The details are irrelevant, but that family has been doing it for decades, literally stealing people's lives. They approach someone, establish a bond, then suck their life force, leaving their body as an empty shell. That's what your fianc and his parents she did the air quotes have done to you. Like vampires are they vampires. It was all my brain could gather. Heather bit her lip and nodded. And what it has to do with the last rule. The last rule says that you owe a favor to whoever gives your life back. Anything they want to. Susan replied. Heather was sweating and looked so guilty I felt bad for her and we want you to dispose of them. Strangely, it didn't seem an unreasonable request. After all, they pretty much killed me. Why shouldn't I defend myself? And what you have to profit from it, I asked, my brain finally functioning again. You see, Susan smirked, and, in an instant, her sclera turned yellow, her irises turned crimson, and her skin became purplish with a leathery texture. Her canines were huge, and her whole presence emanated menace and malice. We are rivals. Story 5. I was logged in as guest 12 at my local library. A few blocks from my home, there's a local public library. I visit it on a regular basis, not necessarily because I'm interested in the books but because they house several computer terminals that can be used to either search for certain titles within a local database or that can be used to go online. I've been an employer for several months and have unfortunately been unable to afford to even the most frugal of internet packages. For now, I'm using my neighbors. Besides that, the terminal has basically been my sole technological resource since I've started to hunt for work. Until this point, everything else has involved person and paper. When I started using this terminal a few weeks ago, I convinced myself that I was close to a breakthrough and that I would hear back from someone in a relatively short amount of time. I could see the light at the end of the tunnel. The first day that I was there, the librarian directed me to a randomly available station. The computers were organized using letters and numbers coupled together with dash. Mine was labeled R1032. Google is my primary search engine, as I'm sure is also the case for many other people. I grew up using the keyboard and have always been somewhat of a speedy typist, although I'm not always the most accurate. The first string of text that I entered into the search bar was garbled in certain spots. I pressed enter anyway, figuring that I'd be able to choose my intended question from the suggestion that would follow on the next page. There's sometimes a source of humor when they're outlandishly incorrect or suggest you something that you weren't intending on looking for at all. I had submitted job search websites as my search request, and it had responded with something that was more alarming than funny. Did you mean I need help? Although I really did need help and it'd be plausible for me to search for it, the suggestion wasn't even close to my original inquiry. 
I used the cursor to highlight the text I had input into the search bar and went to press backspace. When I did, the search page remained, but a command console appeared over it, covering about a fifth of the screen. Its font seemed primitive and age, but bright over its black background. At the bottom of the window, a white square blinked every few moments. It was a field that I could type text into. Apparently, it was intended for responses or other commands. In this case, a reply, the computer seemed to want information. Hello, is this user guest 12? It read clicking outside of the console to get back to the web browser. Any time that I did, the bar along the top edge of the console window would flash for a few moments and, shortly after, the white square would resume its slow blinking. I was locked in, unsure of what was going on. I typed yes in a quick attempt to dismiss it. It didn't go away, but instead generated another line of text almost immediately. Annoyed, I glanced to see what it was so that I could get rid of it and get on with filling out as many applications as I could. It was a question that was more vague and bizarre than it was procedural. Can you help? I considered calling over one of the administrators and moving to another terminal. I didn't have time for this, and I was start to becoming a little more unnerved than I was upset. At the same time, I was highly intrigued. I furrowed my brow as I wondered what this could be about. Even if it was strange or threatening, I could always report it to the staff or even just unplug it. I typed how into the response field and let it sit there for a moment as I continued to think. It took me a few moments before I actually pressed enter. On cue, the terminal processed the question and generated the needed explanation. I need you to bring me these. Underneath the sentence, a small list had appeared. It contained the titles of about a dozen different books, along with the appropriate labels that I could use to find them. They seemed to cover a range of different subjects, including biology, physics, medicine, as well as animation and design. None seemed like they would be too hard to find, but I was still puzzled. I asked the obvious question, why? Scan them in, you will be compensated. Please enter the email address associated with your PayPal account. I had to read it several times. I'd never had an exchange with any computer or anything artificial that was anything more than obviously automated. This seemed like something completely different, and I was admittedly very fascinated by it. My PayPal account was at absolute zero, and there hadn't been in any money in it in years. I bit my lip, considering the possibilities. I typed in my address and pressed enter. The computer responded almost instantaneously once again. Check the balance. I was no longer locked into the command console's window. I moved the cursor around in circles for a few seconds to verify my freedom. I went to PayPal's home page and logged into my account, and it wasn't much longer until I was looking at my balance statement. It stood at $5,000 evenly. I shifted in my chair a little bit to redistribute my weight. I was really starting to get nervous. The transaction had been sent from an address that looked like gibberish. The terminal didn't wait for my response this time, and instead displayed another statement. There will be another deposit. If you bring them to me, he can also all be taken away. Will you bring them to me? In my current financial state, it probably wouldn't even have taken that much to convince me. I walked away from the terminal and up to the front desk. 
The receptionist looked at me over her glasses in acknowledgment. I asked her for a pen and a piece of scratch paper, which she was delighted to obtain for me. I took them back to the terminal and transferred the list of books from pixels to ink. I arranged them in alphabetical order and then spent the next hour or so prowling around the shelves, fingering through the space between all of the spines. I really didn't even have any idea who I might be doing this for. Whoever they were, they had access to large amounts of money, somehow. Probably not legally, the guilt didn't linger for too long, once I imagined eating a nice meal that night. I got the first six, then brought them back to the terminal before fetching the second six. Once I degathered them all, I sat down in front of computer R103-2 again. There was no console window on screen, and I wasn't sure how to access it manually. I didn't have to struggle for too long. Once I moved the mouse, I was locked into another dialogue with the command console, in which the computer addressed me again. Place them under the desk. I thought for a moment, but didn't take the time to ask why it wanted me to. I tucked them tightly into the corner, against an edge. Afterwards, I typed OK into the text field. I panicked for a few seconds as the computer seemed to hang up, thinking that it might have frozen. Then lines of text began to appear and make their way across and down the black background. It had generated a short paragraph. We are unable to complete the scan at this time. Please return to this station later tonight. The door will be unlocked for you. We will be able to proceed with the scan that time. I don't think that I fully understood what it was asking me to do. The shadiness of the request definitely had me questioning legality once again. I wasn't sure if it was asking me to break in, so to speak. I suppose not, since the door would be unlocked. But how would it be unlocked? Was one of the staff going to leave it open? For me, what did that mean? I considered just leaving the library, take the money, and run, as they say. I think that's what I would have done if the terminal hadn't implied that it could remove the funds just as easily as it had put them in. I typed OK once again, and the console window shut down. I stared at the desktop for a while. A few seconds later, a window popped up that said logging off, and finally it settled on the login screen and began to idle there. I left the library and thanked the receptionist for the pen and paper on the way out. When I came back to the library that night, I spent a lot of time looking around before I even tried the door. It was crisp, and I had to put on a jacket for the walk there. The exterior of the library looked largely the same. There weren't any vehicles in the small parking lot that stretched out from the front door. I didn't see or hear anybody around. I stood and checked my surroundings a bit more before finally deciding to pull open the door. It didn't resist, and I made my way inside. It was fairly dark, besides a few areas that were lit by whatever light emitted from the electronic devices. From the front door, I could see where my terminal was against the far wall. Apparently it was on because I could see a ray of light being projected from the monitor onto the bookshelf across from it. Nevertheless, I could still see well enough to navigate the library's interior. I made my way to or 1032. I pulled the chair out a few inches from the desk and crotch to grab the books that I'd left in the corner. Thankfully, they were all there. I would have hated to hunt for any of them again, especially in the dark. I sat down, 
with the thick stack of books before placing them to the right of the monitor so that they could be referenced at a moment's notice. I moved the mouse to see if it would wake the terminal, and it did. The command console window appeared. Use the nearest scanner. Scan the first page of each book. The rest will be found. It took me all of a half hour to get the pages scanned in. Once I had, the terminal prompted me again. It's shown that Robert Hogue Rawlings Library has a three-dimensional printer on the network. Please press enter to begin three-dimensional printing. It had been absolutely silent until the machine in the staff room began to whirl and roar. It was so loud that it startled me. I glanced back at the command console window again, but there weren't any additional messages. I could see a light through the office glass behind the receptionist's desk. The sound became more unpredictable and, frankly, terrifying. It sounded as if it were working up to an explosion or malfunction or something excessive in power that would shake the area. I got up from the terminal and practically sprinted to the printer. It sounded like it was choking now. Once I entered the room, it went quiet. The last sound that it made was a low whine, signifying the end of its cycle. I looked around again before opening the front cover, which almost smelled like it was smoking. I squinted as I tried to make out the shape in the darkness. Whatever it was, it was very small. The texture of its color looked like tan rubber. The smell was a little stronger now. I reached in and held it in my hand. I was startled by the sensation of what felt like loose flesh. It scared me so much that I dropped it onto the floor with a quick retraction of my wrist. I heard it splat, nausea started to set in, and the smell was making me want to gag now. I felt for a light switch in the dark and found one. I tried to calm down and catch my breath as I leaned against the edge of a nearby doorway. Before my eyes caught sight of what had splattered on the floor, it looked like some kind of fetus. It was slightly larger than any I had seen, but it still very much resembled one. Its head had cracked when I dropped it. The eyeball seemed to hang from the socket. Its undeveloped mouth was shaped into an O. I was paralyzed for a little while. I knew that I couldn't leave it there. I picked up what I could and cupped its body in the palms of my hands. I knew that there was a dumpster out back. I jogged outside and over to it as the mushy texture of whatever it was sank into my skin. It felt like I was tainted. I couldn't look at it as I threw it in or while I brushed my hands off afterwards. I went back inside and closed the front cover of the printer. I went back to the terminal so that I could put the books back onto the shelves. I didn't want anyone to know that anyone had been here or that those books had been gathered up for anything. Just looking at the light of the monitor made my heart sink. I just felt filthy and low. I didn't see the console window. I moved the mouse, but nothing happened. I ran the web browser and went to the PayPal homepage. My balance set at $10,000. Is it sick that that excited me? Even if only little, I don't know if it's wrong to admit that. I shut down the web browser and intended to leave the library immediately. I closed the window and logged out. As I watched the terminal shut down, the screen went black for a few moments, but then I could see that I was being logged in again. It booted up and... Once again, I was at the desktop. I moved the mouse. This time, the console window appeared. Hello, is this user guest 13?